Just, just. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, excellent. No, I, I kind of walked, so it might 
to our first paper session, 1A. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Jessica Rogers, and she is going to talk to us about using all sky cameras for dark sky awareness. Yeah, that definitely doesn't make me any less nervous. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Jessica Rogers, uh, the director of the Marshall W. Allworth Planetarium, University of Extremely nervous up here right now. But I'm also really excited to share with you this project that I've been working on for probably about two years now. Um, so to start off, sure most of us know the scourge that is light pollution um, with the growth of populations and cities we are seeing lots and lots of light pollution of course just the excessive light that isn't going down to where you want but is going up into the sky and causes celestial objects now there's more effects than just that uh, there's effects that it has on our hormone cycle, circadian rhythm. There's devastating effects on ecosystems. You want to know more. Um, but needless to say, light pollution is a problem. So one of the ways that we can kind of discuss how good or bad light pollution is, is with the Bortle scale. So this is a scale from one to nine, with nine being your You can see maybe the moon, and that's about it. And then you have all the way down to one, which is your pristine dark skies with no artificial light pollution. So, pinks and reds and whites, those are your inner city. And then your grays and blacks, those are your pristine, your ones and twos on the Bortle scale. And for the eastern half of the US, it's bad. There's lots of light pollution. Um, and that's because it's very densely populated. There's a lot of people who live here. However, if you take a peek right up here where I'm at in northern Minnesota, we are very fortunate to have level one pristine dark skies in the very, very northern parts of Minnesota. Now, part of this area is a region we call the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. I'm just going to call it Boundary Waters. This is a portion of the Superior National Forest. And I'm bringing this up because the Boundary Waters last year was awarded uh, International, Dark <laughs> International Dark Sky Sanctuary status, um, which is it's a big deal. Uh, there are 15 of these in the world. And the Boundary Waters is the largest of those. Um, and it's, it's in my backyard. So because of this, and because of the dark skies we have, um, my planetarium does a lot of work on raising awareness for the unique opportunity that we have and trying to explain why we want to preserve that. So we have a bunch of events that we do. These are two of the big ones, our Dark Sky Caravan and our Dark Sky Festival. But the one that... I want to talk to you about is our newest project. Um, and so this is in collaboration with the Gunflin Trail Historical Society. We have placed an all sky camera up on the museum of the Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center, which sits at the end of the gun. Location was picked because it is right here, right? My hand is shaking so bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's right on the edge of the boundary waters, so right at those level one dark skies. But it's a staffed facility, so we have someone that can maintain the camera. Uh, so this is our camera system. We are using an Alcor Omega 3C all sky system. Yeah, I have to look because my mind's blank. 
um, ASI 178MC camera with a 2.5 millimeter all sky lens. And it's all situated in a sealed climate controlled dome with a heater because northern Minnesota in the winter gets very cold. Um, so we have that heater in there so that it can function all year round. <sighs> um, the camera is controlled by the All Sky Eye software. Um, what it does is it runs the camera from 30 minutes before sunset to 30 minutes after sunrise, um, takes pictures roughly once a minute. The gain and exposure are automatically controlled by the software based off of properties that I input when I set everything up. So those do change as conditions change. Um, the software also automatically converts the raw image into a processed image and then saves that JPEG. And then at the end of the night or the end of the observing session, um, the software also automatically compiles all of the images into a time-lapse video, which is then also saved. Um, so the public facing side of this project launched at the end of July. Um, so we have a web page for the camera that is hosted on my planetarium's website, and that's the web address up there. Um, on the web page, you can find information about the camera, our partners, its location. You can also find the latest image that the camera took. So you can get kind of a, a live view of what's going on during that active period. It also shows the latest time-lapse video that was compiled and has links to archival data. So past images, past time-lapse videos, all of that. Um, in addition to the web page, we also have a Facebook page for the camera. Um, every time that we have a time-lapse video uh, that is compiled, it is automatically uploaded to Facebook and then automatically posted so the followers of the page can see it. We also use this Facebook page to um, announce uh, exciting things that are happening. If we happen to see, hey, there's a lot of cool stuff going on tonight, you should go check out the website, go see what's going on, um, or just give you know updates and things on the camera. All right, so let's get into our results. Um, this is one of many, many, many oh. absolutely gorgeous night sky images that we got from our camera. Um, you can see there's a little bit of clouds down there, but for the most part, I mean, stunning, which is why we have the camera up there at the edge of the boundary waters. Um, but the other benefit to having the camera up there is proximity to the aurora. And last week, we had stunning display. Now, I got excited and I went ahead and posted it to Dome Dialogues. Um, so if you've already seen it, I hope you don't mind seeing it again. If you haven't seen it, just wait. And I'm just going to let it play. So this was back on um, the night of November 3rd. We'll just wait. It gets better. I have watched this hundreds of times and I still am not tired of it. And this is my favorite, but the purples. Like the purples, oh, it's so pretty. So that's what our camera does. <laughs> um, so like I said, we've been public since the end of July. This is an ongoing project for the past, I want to say two years we've been working on. 
Um, since we went public, the webpage has had a decent amount of activity. I unfortunately don't have the stats since the November 3rd um, Aurora, so I don't know how much bigger that number is right now. Um, I do have it for our Facebook page, though. Before the November 3rd, we were at 70 followers. After, we're at like 260 now, which is awesome. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> um, we've also had our challenges being remote location. We've had power issues. Um, we've put a battery backup in that seems to be fixing. I'm also in a struggle with YouTube right now. Don't want to get into it. Um, <laughs> but future plans, um, we have improvements we want to do to the web page. Obviously, lots of ways we can implement the data and videos and images and stuff. Um, but the biggest next step is we have purchased a second camera that is going to go on the roof of the planetarium in Duluth and be used to really highlight the difference between a light polluted sky and those pristine dark skies up at Chippewalk. And I'm done. Thank you. So, yes, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Be sure to talk into the microphone for our online folks and the recording and whatnot. I saw that you had a comment online from someone who wanted like a flat screen view of it. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know why they might appreciate that view instead of the all sky? Because I know like us as planetarians love that full dome kind of effect, but how might the public enjoy the other type of view? I think it's seeing, right? They're used to seeing the square flat pictures. Um, so it can be a learning experience to learn what the all sky view is. Thing a secondary camera. Um, but yeah, that's something that I honestly hadn't even thought about until we had that comment. Um, so you're presenting this at a uh, are there any restrictions to how a planetarium might use your uh, data? It is uh, all of the images and video are open to the public to download to give us credit. Jessica, I was just wondering, uh, are you running, is the camera uh, not running when it's cloudy? Will it automatically turn off? Or are you just running it consistently? It, it runs consistently. It's moving itself when it's cloudy. It's still a really cool video. I'm excited to see as we ramp up the solar cycle the next few years, too. I, I, after, after last week, I just, I can't wait. question is about uh, maintenance of the window over the top of the camera. How often do you have to go out and clean that? Uh, there have been a couple of nights where I get jump scared by suddenly there's a spider sitting on it. Um, but yeah, we really haven't had any issues with we've had to deal with yet. All right, thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we're going to have Erin Brady, and she's going to be talking about creating a Which they're fucking with, so I can make that real. 
Hello, everyone. Carolina, and today I'll be talking about creating a personalized experience that is unique to your planetarium. So we are still relatively and a brand for our planetarium so that when people are coming, they know what to expect from us and to know a little bit about what it is that our dome does. Since while and out from others, and so the idea is to think about those things and find what can be emphasized for your space to make it specific to your local community. So this past year, obviously, none of us have really been inside of our dome. are we having connection with our audience? If it's a live remote show, obviously you're gonna be talking to them, but even by sharing something that's familiar to them. For example, if it's with some elementary school group, Boy Scout, Girl Scout troop, there is some elementary school building or a meeting building that is gonna be software so that it's a familiar location that they instantly recognize. If it's through a pre-recorded show, using this not only emphasizes that it is a specific show designed for them, especially for them, um, but it also shows you and use it while you're talking about other content in your software. And so that's the route that we went for different elementary schools in our area. And since it was focused locally, we talked about ideas and topics within the North Carolina education standards for elementary schools and we let these schools know ahead of time we would be making a planetarium video for them. And so sometimes we would hear back from them and we were able to include birthday shout outs for different students, um, which actually brought a lot more joy than we anticipated it would. We also were fortunate to have two groups come for a field trip right before everything shut down. And so when we made their specific video, we were actually in able to include a handout worksheet that we did with them in their video so they're able to see some of their to tie into their initial experience with us in our dome. And so now that things are starting to open up again and we can have shows in the dome, there's a similar way to do this without having to change every single show you ever made for every new group coming in. So a smaller detail that is just as effective by adding it in can be a mascot or a logo for a school because speaking from experience, you can easily find it on their website and download it. And so including that in the beginning of your show again, includes the group being somebody in the audience that it's for them. Even if the content is the same, this one element makes it very personal to their group experience. And when people come to the planetarium, what they expect is to see a star show. And while it's important to meet this expectation and it's a lot of what we do, it doesn't mean that we have to stay to that or we can't go beyond what is expected. So there are several different ways to do a star show with a twist. Um, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about themes. And I apologize, I am talking um, So one way to think about themes is to look at a certain month and see what are the holidays and events that are taking place. So for example, in September, the event was the autumnal equinox. It was also the beginning of our academic semester. And so our theme was balance, talking about objects in the night sky that are opposing. So for example, Methuselah is the oldest known star and is also not visible to the naked eye, which was balanced by Rigel, a very bright young star that is easily spotted in the night sky. Using themes this way also allows for additional content to be brought in. So for a bright and prominent star, you can easily find it. It's in the constellation Lyra. It is also a part of the summer asterism, the summer triangle asterism. For us in High Point, we are actually part of the Piedmont Triad. And so we are able to draw parallels between those two shapes, local and up in the sky. 
Vega was also the center of the apparent magnitude system, um, which is actually backwards to connotation since we'll talk a little bit about that. And in a similar vein, Vega was also near the center of an HR diagram where the colors and temperatures or stars are again backwards from your connotation. So beyond just the stars, constellations, and planets. And personally, I love using panoramas and decorating them, so I often include very ridiculous additions to our home panoramas for these different monthly shows. So it's another layer of something to be excited to see change and different each month. But before you even get into your show, you can start building your planetarium, how you introduce yourself. So this could be a voiceover welcome, letting ev welcoming everyone to your space, it could be a certain music or a theme song that you use to start off your show. It's from the different colors, bringing the lights up or down, or some other visual cue to let people know that your planetarium experience is about to begin. And so for us, our logo, logo is a central identity for us, and so we bring that in with a chasing ring of light, some really loud, over-the-top, bombastic music that may or may not come from the Marvel Universe, and we use that before we start off every show. So it is a familiar constant, no matter what well for us, since it mirrors who we are, what it is that we do in our planetarium. A completely different way to start thinking about how to build an identity or a brand is to actually include things outside of your planetarium through a highlight piece. So this could be something as the history for a certain event that's going to be taking place in your town or in your um, building. It could be different events and activities that you or other could be a new or temporary exhibit that'll be opening up that you want to let people know about, or different academic or athletic achievements by your school or the local high school. And since opportunity to share undergraduate student research. So not only will this potentially spark research interest in other students that are in the building, but is also a tool for our students to research in a concise and clear manner since it's capped at about one to two minutes. And let's say because everything's timed out to the T, there's one last part of the show to consider that is actually not a part of your show at all, and that is before it starts. So similar to a movie theater, people often show up to planetarium shows early. They want to, they want to make sure they don't miss anything. So why not take advantage of this time since everyone will be waiting there anyway? So like a movie theater, you could play previews and trailers for different shows or movies you will be showing. Or you could take the opportunity for internal or external advertisements, maybe even for local companies. Or you can use this for content, astronomy fun facts, some kind of trivia or other resources that are available for people that are in your audience. Or this could be the perfect time to include one of those highlight pieces. Since we are in our natural sciences building, we have a lot of research facilities in our building. And so we actually have a pre-show slideshow where we show full dome images of our different research spaces and places, which is especially useful for our prospective student events since they are often not able to get into these different spaces on their own or during this one day on that visit. Um, and so the main idea with this is that there are unique things to your planetarium either that you do and you would like to highlight or that you can start to emphasize to the community. This is by no means an extensive list. This is just what we have found in our short two-year lifespan so far that have been pretty easy for us to do as a two-person who collectively make up three-quarters of a person, actually, um, team. But it has been very effective in establishing who we are, not only in our building, but across campus and what we do and how we operate. Thank you. So did I understand correctly uh, toward the beginning of your presentation that those were panoramas of some of the schools that you work with? Yes, so we have not been able to work directly with a lot of our schools since we can't openly have public schools on the college campus right now. Um, and so we started to reach out on our schools. So 
right before it shut down, I actually drove between two days to 20 different elementary schools in the area to take all of those images um, so we can create those panoramas for our software um, in the hopes that one day after Oh, that's really cool. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, do you have, um, what do you use to capture 360 photos or video for, because, you know, that's a great idea to have, like, advertising or prefer to do that? Do you um, so I've worked with two different cameras in particular. The one that I started off using that I need to use the one for those hemispherical images. Um, the other that I've recently been working with, we were fortunate to purchase, was the Insta360. Of course, a little bit more pricey. will be getting started. Bear Planetarium Smart Telescopes and Internet for Real-Time Astronomy. So we'll get started in 52 seconds.
right, Jim, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me okay? I'm assuming the audio is okay. Talk at length at one time. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me remotely. I really, really wish I could be there. I miss seeing a lot of you. I just couldn't make it this time. Normally, I work on really large planetariums, uh, like the one in Shanghai recently, Air and Space Museum. And when the wound up, although I was still teaching, uh, receiving us received a smart telescope and uh, started to do what I call plein air planetarium. Uh, and you'll see why. It's because I started to use this telescope for outreach programming, other programs I could do. And I found out that it was a lot like operating a planetarium. So spoiled generally because we don't have, uh, let's see, how do I advance? Okay, because we, uh, we can create artificial skies, but everyone would admit that having the real sky available, uh, like uh, Jessica, your talk is fabulous of uh, being up in Minnesota. Uh, I liked your talk too, Aaron, but having that dark sky in Hibbing really looks fabulous. Even if you're in a, in a city, and I've been in a city, I've been in New York and observed from the rooftop of my building, uh, even that contact with the real sky is really terrific. And a lot of people do programs with that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk to you about the use of a smart telescope to do these sorts of programs. I'm going to first talk to you about the challenges of doing real-time astronomy under the real sky. I'm going to show you a little bit about how a smart telescope works, at least the one I have, in case you're not uh, familiar with them. I'll show you some of the things I look at. Then I'm going to show you the types of programs I worked on or the types of programs I think could really work out nicely with these. Then finally, I'm going to tell you the lessons I learned. I've done a bunch of programs both remotely over the internet and in person over this last uh, 22 months, actually. So everyone who's done any sort of observing program knows the challenges involved. First of all, clouds, uh, they are they're always happen exactly when you don't need them. Uh, there are often challenging events. I mean, I loved your camera, Jessica. In fact, I'm going to share some of that stuff with people because although a lot of people want to see the aurora, the meteorites, or I mean meteors or comets, they may not happen or they just don't produce the way we would like. Uh, light pollution, of course, is the plague that we all live under uh, that challenges everything. And the moon and the planets, which are the usual objects people go for, they're only available, well-placed for public programming at certain times of the month. And then telescopes and their equipment can be relatively unmanageable. So I was lucky enough to, uh, right at the beginning, I would gotten a lead on these. I've got a EV scope, it's a smart telescope, uh, right near the beginning of the, the COVID lockdown. I've been using it, I think I've been outside about 85 times in the past uh, 20 months. Let me tell you a little bit about what these things are like. So. On the left is an EV scope. They're made by Unistellar. It's what we call a smart telescope. And although it's only about four and a half inches in diameter, the, uh, the, the objective, it per performs about like a one meter Dobsonian. And it's they're also lightweight in there and there's no wires attached. I had some amateur say to me, he said, well, where's the wires and the battery supply? I said, we really don't need those. So it has tremendous advantages and can perform remarkably well. Uh, First of all, it also, it has in it the ability to find where it's pointing and track and then find objects very quickly. Within minutes, I can be off looking for things and finding very challenging things, even in a light polluted sky. I always tell people it's a little bit like having a, a good hunting dog. It, it sniffs the, the prey out very, very quickly and easily. So what's it like under the hood of one of these things? This is more of a little tech talk. They're four and a half inch Newtonian, at least the EV scope is. It's about a four uh, F4 thing with about a 25 arc minute field of view. It has a CMOS, it's a color sensor. Uh, the resolution is pretty good at 1.7 arc second. What's also key with these things is they have autonomous field detection. Those are, they do plate solving in the computer on the telescope, so they know what they're looking at. And they have an object database and they track automatically very well. 
They also do image processing on the fly, namely they, they have an enhanced mode where it takes an image every four seconds and then averages them and stacks them. And what you'll see this does is this really fights the light pollution way down. The magnitude limit on my scope, I live on the west side of Chicago, okay, and it's terrible outside. I've got alley lights, I got overhead wires, I got cats, dogs, I got skunks that come by, and yet I can get to 16th magnitude without much trouble. It'd be 18th magnitude if I could get out of town. The other thing that's interesting about these uh, telescopes is, at least mine is capable of 10 Wi Fi observer connections. So I can have people on their phones or, or laptops. Well, yeah, maybe laptops or, or even uh, iPads. All they have to do is have the app and it's free and they can see exactly what I'm looking at. Let me show you what it's like to actually observe with one of these scopes. First of all, the thing weighs 19 pounds. So there's absolutely never an excuse for me to pick it up and go outside if it's good out. It's easy to get going. You control it with a smartphone. That's what you're seeing on the right side of the screen. You're seeing what my smartphone looks like. Uh, I can talk to you about the technical details later, but that's how it's controlled over the Wi-Fi. And uh, you basically turn the thing on, point it at the sky, it figures out what it's, where it's pointed, and then it's ready to go. Uh, it, uh, then it can find objects and track. You, you have a database on the phone, or you can enter in uh, coordinates as well. Uh, and it goes right to them, and it points to within a couple arc minutes. Uh, and then it has this, this enhancement mode, and this is where it's continually stacking the images. I'm going to show you what's a, a, uh, a shot of M51, uh, I think last spring, and I'm going to condense about 20 minutes into a, just a few slides here, but this is what it looks like at first. And then gradually, within a couple minutes, you start to see the deep sky objects. And when you get to, uh, in this case, approximately 20 minutes, you can do quite well. And you can digitally zoom and, and go in on the objects. So uh, this is what it's like. So it's like you're watching it appear gradually. These telescopes, rather than a big aperture telescope that gulps photons, these telescopes sip them. And as, as, as they sip them in, the image unfolds. It has IPs. The IPs viewing is actually quite good. And also sharing online is easy. So uh, I would like to do something, but I don't think the weather's going to cooperate. But all I have to do is share. I can do a zoom off my phone. You can see exactly what I'm observing. Let me show you some images I've taken. It does nicely on the moon. Uh, it does nicely on planets. It's not really optimized for them. Uh, they're very. They're actually too bright, almost too bright for that thing. I have to turn the gain way down. Uh, it's really optimized for the real faint things. Uh, when I'm with people, Pluto, they like Pluto. I can see Pluto relatively easily. You have to know what you're looking at. You need a finder chart, but it will do planets well. Uh, planetary nebulae really well. Orion is fabulous. Uh, this is only after a minute or two, you can see that. And here's M51 again. Looks great quickly, but if you go all the way to 50 minutes, you're in great shape. Now here's Galaxy M87, not too spectacular to look at, but I wonder if you, can you see where the, the jet is? Take a second. I did this, show this to a friend of mine, I talk about black holes, you can actually start to see the jet on M87. So the basic bottom line with this is that if it's dark out and clear, there's always something to see from almost anywhere. And this I've worked on programs with telescopes since I worked at the Adler back in the Jurassic, and this has always been a challenge. So the program opportunities are nice. Let me go through these quickly. Uh, you can connect an iPad. This works very nicely at public star parties. Uh, you can do Zoom uh, eyepiece observing. You can, uh, the SETI Institute is a partner with this telescope, and they do some really interesting citizen science projects with asteroids, comets, and exoplanets. Uh, people get involved. College courses, I have friends who use it in their college courses. It's really nicely set up for that, even if you have to teach them remotely. And also, it'd be great for astrotourism because the thing weighs 19 pounds. You could get it out, uh, you know, the Chaco Canyon here, if you like, for that sort of programming. So here are the lessons I've learned. From in-person star parties, I found that they're very popular. People like looking at the image, even if it's on their phone or on an iPad. Uh, they didn't have a feeling that they wanted to look at it any other way. 
you need to be prepared for science discussions on astrophysics because you're not fiddling with simple things. You're often looking at deep space objects. So that's important. You need to help them understand the distances. I always get questions about light years. And in fact, with my telescope, I've looked out the six billion light years without too much trouble. So you got to be prepared to deal with that. And then you really, I've learned you want to share your images with the audience as quickly as you can. You can text them out, you can email them out, uh, you can share them with them quickly. They like that, and they, I found that they actually share them themselves. So finally, what about the second lessons I've learned in remote Zoom events? I've done this uh, several times, you, all the way to Russia. You, you need a storyline, it's important, just like a sky show. I was telling my wife, I said, this is like planning a sky show. You need to plan your time zone differences and rehearse carefully. You need to go out a month early or two hours later to take images and understand what you're looking at. And you know, it's, it's like a sky should just fuse a few things and that are, have a meaningful connection or theme and stay with them. And then make sure you know about the astronomy because you're gonna get the questions back and sometimes the tech too. Anyways, I wanna thank you. I'm happy to answer questions here or you can ask, write to me online. Uh, uh, I want to thank you and wish you have a nice follow-up meeting. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of your papers. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. I had a question for Jim. Okay. Hey, Jim, you said that you are streaming to Zoom off of your phone. Um, yeah. You have to connect to the telescope using Wi-Fi. So are you using the same exact device? To connect to the telescope as you are to host the Zoom meeting? Yes. Uh, what I use is, uh, right, so the phone only can makes one Wi Fi connection. That's how you control the, the telescope. The telescope is an onboard computer that basically does the image processing, finding objects, and so on, and tracking. The, the phone has GPS and gets the time that, that you need. So, what happens is you use, in my case, the ATT digital connection out to the internet. So you, you couldn't just take an iPad that only has a Wi-Fi connection. That won't work. You need a cell connection as well. Okay. So with the cell connection on the iPad, I can just then connect online as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Dr. Fletcher, I have a question real quick. Did I understand correctly that this telescope self-orients itself? You don't have to say this is Vega and that is out there. You just turn it on and it finds itself? Yes, it's, it's like that dog. It has what's called plate solving software in it. So basically you turn it on, you gotta make sure you're focused. There's a couple of things you have to worry about to get started, but it takes me 10 minutes to get going. Then you just point it to an open area of the sky where it can see stars and you tell it to, to field locate. And it takes about a minute and it, it dithers around a little bit uh, and uh, it, it does a process called plate solving that says, I know where I'm pointing. And from then on, you can go on the database on the phone for the objects. You can enter the object name in, if it's an NGC object, a Messier object, or even just the coordinates. You tell it to go and it goes right there. And, and once you're on, then it tracks. They'll tell you that. So it is like a good hunting dog. All right, one more quick question. Jim, it's Mitch Lumen in Evansville. You, you and I have been working together on these EV scopes for the, most of uh, this spring. Uh, could you explain to everybody uh, the, the, uh, how easy it is for people to put this app on their phone? Uh, I, I thought that people wouldn't want to put this strange app on their phone to use it, but I'm just so shocked that people are just so eager to do this. Could you explain your uh, experience with that, uh, you know, loading this app on their phone? Right, you're exactly right, Mitch. Uh, people will put if I'm going to a star party like in Naperville, I go some, I'll tell people ahead of time and some people will install it. it. Doesn't it's not a huge app, it's not hard to install, it doesn't cost anything. App, then they can connect through the Wi-Fi to the scope. The scope will handle 10 uh, Wi-Fi connections. I'll be the operator. The others are called. Save the, they can save the images themselves uh, and so on. So, yes, th that has been an interesting uh, surprise. Awesome. All right, and our next speaker is Dale Smith.
uh, going to talk about Lowell's can cana canals. I can speak. Bye. <laughs> How would you like your people to be honored? Do you want me to say something? Or just Hey, good afternoon. Percival Lowell is a name that we all know. We know that he had a lot of things wrong. He also had a lot of things right. Um, and I had been told he was a good writer. And I found, uh, for a reasonable price, reprints of three of his books, Mars, Mars and his Canals, Mars, Debo to Life, and read them last spring. And I was entranced by his writing. Um, as I was reading it, I knew he was wrong but I wanted him to be right. <laughs> and that's, that's the, the primary point of this talk, is just how good a writer um, he was. He was a true believer in canals. We know that he was wrong in that, but once he knew there were canals there, he knew there were Martians there. And we know the story behind that. Um, he, one of the things he got right um, was building Lowell Observatory. Uh, Lowell, as you probably know, was a from a wealthy Boston family, they had money. He had enough funding to build an observatory himself, and or to, to have it built. He chose an excellent site on Flagstaff, Arizona, which still um, has, that when I visited friends there, I could barely see to walk in the streets at night. But he knew to build at a high altitude site. Um, flag is up at about 7,000 um, and some hundred feet. Um, he knew to build in a site where there was no light pollution. So he, those were two things he had very right. Um, and he was just an engaging and passionate writer. Um, and I, now I've, I'm not going to read this whole thing. I've quoted it I mean, in the proceedings. But I want to do a couple sentences. Once he knew there were Martians there, um, that took us out. Oh, I'll just use his words. They're better than mine. Their presence certainly ousts us from any unique or self-centered position in the solar system. And believe me, I wanted that to be true as I read it. I knew it wasn't, but I was still captivated by it. And drying up. And I just want to read the last about four lines. The drying up of the planet is certain to proceed until a surface can no longer support life. Surely, or slowly but surely, time will snuff it out. When the last ember is thus extinguished, the planet will through space, its evolutionary career forever ended. How can you read that and not want it to be true? As, as I read it, I, I knew all most, of the, all most of the mistakes he'd made. His hero was Scaparelli, um, the Italian who first saw lines on Mars. Um, called them channels. The Italian word for channels is canali. And as we know, that's readily mistranslated into English as canals. Um, and here is, I forget which book this is from, but this is Lowell's dedication to Schiaparelli, um, the Columbus of the new planetary world, back in the days when we said that Columbus discovered America. We know the, uh, the history of that uh, phrase. What Scaparelli thought of all this, I don't know, but um, he was Lowell's hero. Um, a little bit about the canals. This you all know um, ahead of time, I suspect. The canals ran from the, the wetter polar regions down to the desiccated equator. They were irrigation canals. Um, and Lowell saw that many of the canals were doubled. You can see that in this uh, drawing. The canals met at nexus points, but Lowell had a better phrase. He called them oases. And oases is a much more evocative word, at least to me, than the, the geometric sort of boring nexus points. Um, Lowell knew uh, that the canals carried vegetation, which advanced as the seasons progressed. You could see the, um, the change in the canals' darkness and color. Um, 
moder ch changing as the seasons progress, starting up near the poles and working down toward the equator. This obviously is an artist's conception. Um, but Lowell knew that the changes in color, of course, um, had to be advanced vegetation. Wrong, yeah, but very, uh, very attractive. He did a lot of calculations that are in some of the books. And I actually read, didn't skip over those pages. Did calculations of thermal effects in the atmosphere and showed, he was wrong, okay, he was wrong, but showed that the atmosphere was warm enough to contain water vapor above freezing so the idea of having canals transporting water um, could work. And then two of the intriguing things, um, we all know that he was, he was seeing illusions, okay? But he was aware of that possibility and in one book had fairly extensive sections showing that what he saw were not illusions um, from his viewpoint. And notice uh, the sentence that got highlighted here in um, yellow, the whole, the whole quote will be in my proceedings article. But the Martian canals, when well seen, are not at the limit of vision where we easily get, get fooled. So Lowell considered the possibility he was seeing illusions and was able to show, um, to his content at least, that he was not seeing illusions. And then what about photographs? Lowell claimed that the canals had been photographed. Now, this was, you know, 110 years ago when films were a little bit slower. And while the eye, can, well, our eyes can work at a speed of roughly a twentieth of a second, um, the camera's image is cumulative. Longer exposures were needed back then. But he described um, taking, taking um, images of Mars and going into the dark. Those of us who use dark rooms know that when you pull the film out of the, the developer in the bath um, and the the fixer, the excitement of seeing that you actually have the image, and lo and behold, there were the canals in his images. So two of the uh, areas we think he got fooled in, we know that he got fooled in, uh, were illusions and photography of the canals, but he considered both of those. Now, unfortunately, in all three books I read, there were no reproductions of his canal photographs. I was sort of frustrated at that. But one of the people he hired at Lowell Observatory, E.C. Slife, for a name some of you will um, recognize, published in 1962 um, a book on photographs of Mars over the, the decades. And here are his images. And I haven't reproduced the caption here, but um, he's claiming to have seen lines on Mars. Maybe um, this image, you can um, see some lines on it. So. So Slifer backed up Lowell's claim that the canals had been photographed. And finally, there were canals, or there were at least lines, on Venus as well. Um, on the left is a, a drawing by Lowell of lines on Venus. He was observing with a 24-inch telescope that he stopped down to 3 inches to F120, F120, that's not a misspeak. And an exposure time of, I think, or I'm sorry, magnification of, of 144. Well, I'm not an optometrist or ophthalmologist, but any ophthalmologist or optometrist, especially ophthalmologist, uh, when they see this drawing, realizes that they are seeing um, the retinal patterns in the human eye. So Lowell was observing his own eyes. So he got fooled in a lot of ways. But he was this incredible writer. Um, I quote, did the writing quote at the beginning so that point wouldn't get lost. And, and I just found myself, I knew he was wrong. I knew where he was wrong. I wanted to believe what he, what he wrote. Um, and one final point that's not really connected um, with the canals. But think about Pluto. We all know the story of Lowell and Pluto and the mistakes he made there. But suppose Lowell had not believed there was a Pluto and hadn't hired Clyde Tombaugh, and Pluto wasn't discovered in 1930, and he didn't know about the Kuiper Belt objects until the 1990s. How would planetary science research have been different without that? So Lowell had a lot of mistakes, 
but he's had, I think, in many ways, a very positive legacy on planetary science and public perceptions of them through the decades. And I'll stop there and be happy to um, answer questions. Hey, uh, so um, I also I read these a, a decade or so ago and um, had even done a project matching Lowell's map to modern Mars. Um, and it had always made me curious the canals, and I was curious if in your reading you'd encountered any scholarship of this over, we sort of know what many of the things we think Lowell, Lowell saw were, but obviously there is like this correspondence between the albedo features of Mars and the oases and, and the, the, the drying wetlands. Um, but one thing features and the canals and how much there is any room for the canals to have been based in fact on shadows from slope gradients um, or if <laughs> there's a well a, Lowell's work versus just the outright dismissal oh good question I, I had not thought about that before but it would, would be fascinating to look at it um. You mentioned that those original images were never reproduced. Were the original ones lost? Could well be wrong on this. Is it was simply tougher, you know, in the 1900s to publish photographs um, than it is now. So that maybe whether that's the reason I don't know. I've sort of assumed that, but it's. I would have loved to see uh, the images he had. You know, Slifer's images were 60 years later. And I Slifer's images. All right, thank you. All right, so in approximately two minutes, boom, it's like a hat in a hat. I added the second part. That's not part of the title.
better? There we go. Thank you. Before I tell you about a dome within a dome, I must tell you how I came to encounter it and how I came to belong to Glippa. The title for this paper derives from A Dream Within a Dream, the Alan Parsons Project. I first encountered the dome as a child at Adler Planetarium in Chicago, where my father would take me to tour the exhibits and watch the shows. I was spellbound. Before long, I began to a dream that would later support my career even when I was between domes. After earning a degree at Northwestern University in 1975, I literally walked into a position that Adler in 1976 with a field trip to the Cernan Theater, so I joined Glippa. When improper construction led to building closure and layoff, I found work directing and upgrading the Pellucci Space Theater in northern Minnesota. When a funding cut eliminated that position, I relocated to central South Carolina to direct a planetarium for his historically black college. When unprofessional treatment by the college led me to look elsewhere, South Florida undergoing complete renovation. I had dreamed for years of building my own planetarium. This opening offered the next best thing. As part of my work there, I joined SEPA and participated in IPS 1988 at Richmond, Virginia. At the SEPA banquet there, my esteemed colleagues taught me to keep my balance and to make music on unusual instruments. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Glippa anymore. Conflict with my supervisor led him to cancel my contract, so I found work in central Mississippi with a former mentor at the site of SEPA 1980. I served as his assistant manager and then succeeded him as manager when he retired in 2001. Years-long chronic pain and fatigue coupled with concern over my widowed, depressed father led me to resign my position in 2008 and return to the Chicago area. When my health improved, I began working at the place where I had first fallen in love with planetariums as a child. Adler did not permit volunteers to operate any of their theaters, so I found something else to do and loved it. I also worked with Peggy Hernandez at the Elgin Observatory and Planetarium. An invitation from our second oldest son and his wife to live near them led us to Western North Carolina. It was love at first sight. We relocated to an apartment complex north of Asheville and two years later bought a manufactured home with spectacular views. Shortly after relocating, I rejoined SEPA and connected with the Pisgah Astronomical Research Institute 90 minutes to my west. As an observing assistant, I helped visitors enjoy deep sky views on a second IDA dark sky park. Inside, I show visitors the stars within Perry's Adventure Dome using Stellarium and a gaming laptop. I also connected with the Asheville Museum of Science, where I quickly received the nickname Star Guy Gary. I was presenting star stories every Sunday afternoon using a four-meter digitarium dome and a starlight projector until the pandemic. I am now learning to program World Viewer by the Illuminati in one of their geodome portals to create open-air star stories. Most recently, after repairing a donated Celestron 4-inch telescope, I supplemented a Meeting the Moon exhibit at the Asheville Museum of Art with The Orb of Night, a PowerPoint presentation, and observing of the moon on their plaza. No matter where I've lived and worked, I know that I belong to an association whose members share my vision of planetariums, whose creativity, passion, and sense of humor I continue to affirm by presenting papers as often as I can. Our annual conferences serve for me as family reunions at which we see the next generation of planetarians spread their wings. Now, as a famous comedian once said, I told you that story to tell you this one, another story of inspired perseverance. The project I discovered began nearly 50 years ago as a landfill operated by two counties in western North Carolina. After 20 years of use, the landfill had filled to capacity and had to be closed. What to do with the methane emissions? As the swindle, one reframed the problem as an opportunity. 
A partnership evolved to transform the landfill into an alternative energy center. The methane emissions would fuel a variety of activities housed within Quonset huts on the center's campus. One such hut housed a ceramic studio where artists used methane-fired kills for pottery. In another hut, methane-fired furnaces enabled glass blowing. Fixed solar panels heated water, greenhouses in the winter. Tracking solar panels provided electricity to power the center. The center even included accommodations for visitors to the facility. Sadly, after 10 years, the methane supply had become unstable and wood-fired furnaces proved unsuitable. After another five years of makeshift operation, the partnership dissolved and Malin Community College took over the facility. ...another kind of facility that capitalized on the site's other natural resources. The College Foundation's executive director shared and supported that vision through her development efforts and Learning Resource Center Dean John Wilmisher helped realize that vision. Rather than focus on what was in the ground, they looked up to the sky and established the site as the Earth to Sky Park. The Blue Ridge Astronomy Group had already been taking advantage of the dark skies over applied for and received designation as an international dark sky park, the first in North Carolina. To help the general public explore those skies, Warren and Larissa Baer provided major funding for a public observatory. The college purchased a large Dobsonian telescope and named it in honor of Sam Phillips. The Baer's son served as first manager of the observatory, assisted by the college's cosmic cowboy. The observatory now hosts hundreds of people each year for regular viewing opportunities and special events. Recent landscaping has improved the facility's appearance and access to the site and includes stations where BRAG members and individuals can set up their own telescopes. To complement the observatory and complete the park, college and foundation officials planetarium, the first in western North Carolina. They selected an architectural firm recognized for its high-tech educational facilities. They also selected helping planetarium succeed as project consultant. Phil had already designed a planetarium built near Charlotte and emulated some of its features in the new design. The design included an exterior geodesic dome, a distinctive feature promoted by Dr. Boyd. It would bear the name of its primary donors, shown here receiving a service award from the YMCA. The construction crew has made steady progress since last year's groundbreaking. One of the Quonset huts will serve as an entrance and visitor center. A hallway and exhibit area will lead visitors to the planetarium theater. The outer dome testifies to the high-tech nature of the facility. It will also provide support for the inner dome and projection surface. As with many geodesic domes, pentagons link hexagons to approximate a hemisphere. Within the theater, a central pit will provide power to an Evans & Sutherland Digistar 7 projection system. Use of a single projector will expedite alignment and eliminate the need for edge blending. A new RGB laser technology should produce bright, crisp images. The flat floor and movable seats will provide flexibility for a wide variety of uses. The outside wall of the building will display a bee mural to tie in with a pollinator garden to be built within the park. A scout bee already graces the renovated facade of the park's conference center. Could these stones leading through the garden to the planetarium provide a stairway to heaven? A single person is managing the entire Earth to Sky Park. Can you say multitasking? God willing, and the pandemic don't surge, the planetarium will open next spring. I look forward to working there in some capacity and reporting on it as a fully armed and operational life star at next year's CLIPA conference. Thank you. Questions? 
All right, well, thank you, Gary. Last speaker for this round of papers, uh, Ken Brandt is going to be talking about The Rising Phoenix, a story of hope, inspiration, and aspiration. One, two, one, two. Welcome to 
my first lipa, which has really been an exciting time for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't really count the the nationwide conference. Conference. So I'm really, really happy to be here, and you guys have made me feel really welcome. So thank you very, very much. Um, as you can see, this is not the first time we've. Oh wow, there's people out there, you know, and no boxes, you know. Uh, hi to everybody in the boxes, by the way. Hey, how you doing? So, it wrecked the island of Haiti back in 2016, and then came up the east coast. Um, I'll let you read. But um, a very wise gentleman in Robinson County, which is where I'm from, uh, after the disaster and the flood, and he said, what you need is an advisory board. So this is what the planetarium looked like. It was a lovely day, except for this whole brownish you know, stuff here. It turns out that was not only river flood water, it was also conduct tours in full hazmat outfit. So there's the Spitz A3P, formerly residing upright, now laying on her side. You can see her resting on one of these seats here. Uh, that was not a pretty fall. It did all kinds of damage, and I won by default the Bent Cage Award for the year. <laughs> There's the bent cage right there over the uh, downrest of the seat. Uh, this is after um, of course, you know, I was more than happy to have him do it. You know, uh, though, yes, this is mold on the seats here. Um, this place has basically sat unventilated and just humid for five years. And not only that, another hurricane came called Florence. We'll talk about that in a minute. But basically, all this white stuff, that's mold. So this place is really slowly degrading. You know, um, That's a hallway leading back into the science center, and everything is just akimbo down that hallway. You know, uh, That's the control panel. If you look really carefully, you can see keys right here. Those are the keys that turn the ignition on for the projector. You know, for those of you with uh, Spitz systems, I, you might be familiar with those. Uh, this is the logo of the Rising Phoenix. Uh, Vicki Liu, who was a senior in high school at the time when she did this um, drawing for us, um, the phoenix over here on the right is the traditional phoenix, and this is the damp component rising up out of the swamp. <laughs> so um, it's kind of a fusion of two ideas. That's a meeting of the rising phoenix. Uh, there's the inflatable behind it with the cutout ceiling so the dome will fully inflate in the planetarium, uh, excuse me, which is now, which used to be an elementary school cafeteria. So this is where I'm operating now. And that's a meeting of the board of the rising phoenix there um, a couple of months ago. Uh, we, I fell in love with these cool interactive displays from the Clark Planetarium. These things are awesome. If you can afford them, you should get them. Um, and of course, the Digitalis Dome back here. Um, if you want to talk about getting inflatables, I've been through more than one rodeo with these things. I've had several systems, and I'll be happy to tell you all about the pros and cons as I saw them. Anyway, so we ran summer programs because this is before the Delta variant really surged, this uh, kind of dead space in July and August here. Uh, you can see how I achieved social distancing. I just had simply had kids stand at these cones on the outside of the dome. When they came inside, they're, they're interacting with the exhibit. There's the cones again. On the inside, uh, I started out using stickers. That ended up being a very bad idea, as you might guess, what um, you know, fourth graders would do with a sticker in 20 minutes of you know, time to use it. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of permanent spots on my floor here to achieve, again, social distancing. But my secret weapon is this little guy right here. That's a Pyridime air filter, the same kind they use in UNC Chapel Hill's surgery suites. 
Uh, I used to be an operating technician when I was in the Navy. By the way, I haven't heard anybody say this today. I'm kind of disgusted by this. Happy Veterans Day. Will all of us who serve please rise? Since nobody else has done this, I should. Okay, well, happy Veterans Day uh, to everybody you know who is one. Um, anyway, moving on. Oops, that image did not translate. That was Darth Vader in his mask. So, of course, uh, the chancellor of our local university, UNC Pembroke, uh, brought up the idea of building a planetarium again last December. So this had kind of been in backwaters. Since I work for a school district, um, the district has many priorities with whatever money they do get to rebuild and restore with. Um, and so far, they haven't gotten the big bucks necessary to build a new school or new planetarium. So lots of letters of support, including from IPS and Sean Latch, uh, writing there as the president at the time. And um, let's see, who is that? Job the Science Center, I think. Uh, Moeth in uh, Daytona. And I've got several dozen of these letters, and thank you all. As a matter of fact, because I asked for letters a long time ago, about three years ago, maybe four, uh, Alan Gould actually put a template up on the U U IPS website. If you need to write a letter of support for someone, um, you can go to that template, and it gives you the, the bare bones, and you, of course, fill in the details. So the template's already written for you. So thank you, Al thank you Alan, for that. Um, I really like Bob Bonadour's uh, top 10 reasons to have a planetarium over here. This is pretty useful stuff right here. I love this. So um, I'd be happy to share that doc with you, or you can ask Bob for it when you see him. So lots of letters of support here, including a partnership with the uh, Chapel Hill Moorhead Planetarium, kind of like uh, what we consider the big dome in the state of North Carolina. It's one of the first, I think it's the fifth planetarium built in the US back in the early 30s. That's their new, newly renovated science center. The chancellor and I and a, an architect named, um, there you go, um, for the young lady who works at High Point, here we go. There's the Colt Planetarium's lobby. And there's the inside of the Colt Planetarium, which I think you've already seen. That's the catwalk. Look at the, behind the dome, the dome crawl. It's like you could take a white glove and do these walls and they were like pure and clean. No one has a dome like that now, right? If you've had a dome running for more than uh, six months, you got stuff back there. You got boxes, crates, and you know, you know the drill. So, and there it is through the Nanocene dome, looking out at the logo there for High Point. So thank you, High Point, for providing that tour back in January for my school board and the chancellor, the architect team, and the construction team. So, the Architects Institute creates a Phoenix plan. Tim? So we've got two minutes. I'm going to do this really quick. Uh, I know you've seen some of this before, but this will be, uh, this is some early work that I did on the programming with Ken before the Architects. Next slide. Uh, and the, uh, we developed the checklist. This is a template that's also on the IPS website. You can download if you're doing a new project. Next slide. These are the initial sketches from the local architects. One more slide. This is now dimensioned plan, shows how you lay everything out. Next slide. This is the presentation plan that was taken to the state legislature. You can see on the next slide what the package looked like. Uh, so there was a, a narrative, showed the history and the idea of the planetarium. And then the last page is the letters of support. So this is the package we helped create to send to the state legislature and other funding sources. Mm -hmm. So Ken, you can close it out in the last minute. Sure. We've got three, actually a little less than three. So reinforcements come in. We had celebrated our 50th anniversary um, last year, and we had a major event. We invited an astronaut back from Houston, uh, William MacArthur, who was the commander of Expedition 12, kind of date him. Um, so he came back. He did a, a presentation for us at the gala we did, met with some school kids, and you know he just had a good time with them. And that's the letter of support from the Bladen County Superintendent, our, our neighbor county to the west. So we made the pitch that to the state legislature that this would be a regional facility that would be used not just by Robinson County kids, but by kids all around the southeastern North Carolina region. And this is uh, one of the support documents I used. I pulled up some test data from the last year where tests were meaningfully done here in North Carolina. Um, you see that blue line down there, orange and blue, of course, 
Um, but the blue line down there corresponds to the difference in science scores above math and, re and math and reading scores among the same population of kids, both um, fifth and third graders. And you can see there's like a 25 point increase in scores. And none of the other surrounding counties had that because up until now, none of them really visited us. So I made the claim. I said, you know, our science teachers are good like everybody else's science teachers. What makes a difference is the fact that they came to the science center and the planetarium and made the statement and got an eight page worth of bibliography to back that happy no nonsense up, you know? Um, you could probably find holes in these stats if you look hard enough, but uh, school board members tend not to look hard enough, <laughs> which is a good thing. All right, so we remain resilient. As of this morning, just our contact information if you wanna reach out to us at all. Um, as of this morning, the, uh, the state legislature of North Carolina is voting on the budget. Um, they're going to vote on it probably Monday and Tuesday of next week and then send it to the governor to sign, veto, or ignore. Now, he can veto it, but there are enough Democrats backing up the Republican leadership to make it pass anyway. So he can veto it all he wants to, but just override it. Um, if he chooses not to sign it, which is probably what will happen in about 10 days, it will become law anyway. That's one of those things that, uh, with the pocket veto, I guess, um, but it's the opposite of that because What's happening there is um, he just doesn't sign it and it come, becomes law. So in that budget is $5 million for the building of the Planetarium and Science Center. Yeah. So that's cool. Next step is also we have FEMA money <coughs> laying around waiting to be arbitrated by the D.C. Law, law firm our school board hired. The guy who runs that law firm used to run FEMA. We were due $85 million. FEMA offered us four. I anticipate us getting four and a half, and about 45 or 50 million from that whole encounter. That's what, that's what the budget negotiators say. Um, with that, our superintendent wants to build a new technical high school, and on the back of the high school, or maybe in the front of the high school, will be the Planetarium and Science Center. So that's in the plan. And the superintendent thinks it's his idea. Because I've been backing that up since day one, basically. I said, the most efficient thing you guys can do is build a new planetarium as part of a new school, you know. Um, and so if you are operating one of those uh, settings, I probably need to talk to you at some point just to figure out how it works. And that is our time. Oh, that, we got, that's a two-minute warning. Sorry, yeah, any questions about anything we're doing? Okay. All right, thanks. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> and thus concludes. Uh, thank you. Uh, is this your table? Uh, no.